Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, my name is Barry Hudson. I'm the Director of Public Information uh, for the county. Um, and I will be pinch hitting today in honor of baseball season uh, for Lorna, who is out today. Uh, today, we are here for the county executives weekly briefing. And we do have a few guests uh, that don't normally join us. Uh, today, we have John Monger, who is the Director of our Department of environmental protection and we're also joined by Sarah Colville Smucker who is our um, chief climate officer or actually climate uh, climate change officer so uh, we're going to do what we normally do have the county executive lead us off with uh, remarks and then we will go into the rest of the day we're also joined as always uh, by Dr. James Bridgers and Sean O'Donnell, who will be giving us a health briefing a little later on uh, in this session. So, Mr. County Executive, I will hand it over to you for opening remarks. Thank you, and uh, good afternoon, everybody, and uh, thank you for joining us again. So, I have to begin today by acknowledging um, the tragedy in Baltimore, the loss of lives there is truly sad. Um, for the workmen who were working on the bridge when this happened. Um, and this is obviously a very serious event. You know, our thoughts go out to the families that are impacted by this horrible situation. We continue to extend our offers of help to the federal, state, and local emergency responders if they need us. Um, so far, they have not. Uh, just hours into the response, we heard from President Joe Biden, who understands how important this port is to our nation and he pledged financial support to rebuild the bridge quickly. It is the largest shipping hub in the U.S. for automobiles and the 11th largest overall. Now, this is likely to be closed for a while. I mean, I've seen estimates, and probably some of you have too, of anywhere from one to two years to seven to 10 years and everything in between. So hopefully it's on the short end of that number, not the long end. We've consistently heard updates from Governor Wes Moore since this happened on Monday. And, you know, this affects a workforce of about 8,000 people who directly depend on the reopening of Baltimore Harbor, Baltimore Harbor. And they need our support. And there's a fundraising campaign out there to help the families of those who lost people, but they're also to help um, with other people who are going to be impacted by, by the port closure. Um, they have to clear the channel. I think everybody understands that. If you saw the bridge go down, uh, it's, you're not getting boats in and out of there until the steel's moved. And hopefully that process will begin as soon as possible. Um, and I'm really grateful that we've had good leadership at both the state and federal level on this, that both have stepped forward in making sure that, that they will do whatever is necessary to get this moving as quickly as possible. I want to turn now to... Um, our trip to Taiwan last week. Um, I was in Taiwan and I was joined by County Council Vice President Kate Stewart and our Director of the Department of Environmental Protection, John Monger, along with Judy Costello, who's the Special Project Manager for Business Innovation and Economic Development. This is the second year that I was invited to speak at the Smart City Summit and Expo about the county's climate action initiatives. And like we did last year, we used this trip to also focus on economic development opportunities by meeting with companies and academic institutions that are interested in expanding into the U.S. market. The companies we met with were particularly interested in our soft landing program for companies expanding in our county. And the soft landing program includes the ability to provide legal assistance to get people incorporated, which makes them eligible for grants from federal and state level as well as the county and uh, to deal with any immigration issues that might arise. Um, the biotech companies and the universities were very interested in the University of Maryland Institute for Health Computing in North Bethesda. AI is very much becoming the watchword in medical research, both in terms of drug development and discovery, but also in terms of patient management and care and long-term tracking of patients. And uh, they have the same interest in this in Taiwan that we do. And to that point, two universities approached us about being able to find space, take space 
inside the Institute for Health Computing, and I was really excited about this. These are the kind of partnerships we hoped uh, we'd be able to develop, and it's good to see them beginning to come about. I also visited with government leaders, including the mayors of Taipei and New Taipei City, and I was able to see how communications and technology were being used to improve the lives of residents there. It is uh, it's a very different environment with here. They deal with earthquakes, volcanoes, um, cyclones, and major downfalls. And what was what really struck me when I asked them about how many of these major events do you typically have in a year, and they said 50. And I'm thinking that's like one a week. Now, some weeks they come grouped together, but that's a lot of emergencies to be responding to. They have a very robust system, and uh, you could see the technology that they had deployed to make sure they can keep residents informed of what's happening. Uh, we once again met with several academic and government leaders who have lived in Montgomery County or studied in Maryland, and they spoke very highly of how the aging community is treated and welcomed here. And much as last year, they are really good ambassadors or in meetings with people from Taiwan who have not been here, having people who have actually experienced and working and living in Montgomery County has proven to be really helpful in terms of helping new people understand what we have to offer. And our highly educated and diverse workforce, plus our location near the nation's capital, many federal agencies is really valued by business leaders overseas. And we're, we weren't just talking to people who were involved in bio, but we we're also talking to cyber tech companies and also, for example, a company that makes uh, solar panels. And in fact, two companies that were making solar panels. And it was very interesting. And in a future day, we'll show you a couple of the, the samples of uh, the panels they've produced. But there's a, a lot going on in the world that we don't always see over here. And Taiwan is one of those places where some of these advances are coming out first. And it was really cool to see some of the new things that are going to become available. Um, this is the latest trip that, you know, uh, we've taken to expand the economic opportunities uh, and very similar to what happened in our missions last year to India, Taiwan, and Vietnam. And I look forward to seeing these connections turn into new jobs and opportunities today. And in fact, today I met with Judy and a uh, gentleman from a company from Taiwan that we recruited last year and now has space in the Rockville Incubator Center. So. Uh, that's that's an exciting development. At this point, I'd like to invite John Munger and Judy Costell to discuss the trip, answer any questions then that you might have. So I'll turn it over to John. Thank you, County Executive. Uh, really appreciate those words. And as the County Executive was saying at the Smart Cities Expo in Taiwan, we really got to see a lot of interesting technologies, uh, hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of booths where folks were showing advanced technologies about including solar panels, as the county executive said, but also uh, one really present theme this year was a lot of technologies and strategies around how artificial intelligence can be used to both reduce emissions, but also improve operational safety when we're thinking about how we go about our work. Um, as you all know, the county is committed to serving as a model, uh, both here in the state, but also nationwide for continuous improvement of our environmental programs. So. It was also really neat to see firsthand some of the recycling strategies and facilities um, that the that Taiwan uses, as well as as well as their development of clean energy technologies and and how they're doing that. It, there was a lot to be impressed by and a lot to learn from. So I share the county executive's enthusiasm about potential opportunities to continue partnering uh, with with the types of entities we got to meet with over there. Um, I was also really. Uh, privilege to get to share all of the successes we have here in Montgomery County for expanding our recycling programs and how we're doubling down on sustainability while also continuously working to improve our services being provided to everyone who lives, works, and plays in Montgomery County. So just a few a few highlights of those as reminders. We have programs here that recycle durable medical equipment. So think about things that are not used uh, for a long period of time, but are very much needed for a short amount of time. We have a partnership with the Maryland Department of Aging where crutches and canes and equipment along those lines is refurbished and given to those in need. Um, we also have a very robust recycling program for other household goods like mattresses, consumer electronics, construction materials, and, and we're building these programs very quickly. So it was very exciting to get to share 
our progress there. So all in all, a very productive, productive exchange and another opportunity to share all the ongoing progress uh, we're making here in the county. Uh, why don't I hand it over to Judy? Thanks, John. And thank you, County Executive. It was a great, uh, it was great to go back to Taiwan. Um, as the County Executive mentioned, we had been there last year and we at both years hosted an event for business prospects who might want to open their uh, um, U.S. headquarters in Montgomery County. And we were gratified to see a couple folks return who came to learn about Montgomery County for the first time last year and then came back and said, uh, we want to learn more and we're interested in moving forward. And as the county executive mentioned, we today we uh, we welcomed the cybersecurity company at the Rockville Innovation Center, who we first met last year at the same business prospect uh, team. But we met with small companies that are um, qualified for our incubators, as well as a couple large public chips companies. John mentioned the uh, recycling programs. We had the opportunity to meet the county executive and council vice president Kate Stewart had uh, warm discussions with the mayors of Taipei and New Taipei City, who are very pro uh, Montgomery County and encouraging of bilateral uh, trade. Um, and uh, we, as has already been said, saw a lot of new and exciting technologies. And of the university partnerships that the county executive mentioned, I've already been we just got back this weekend, and one of them would like to sign a memorandum of understanding at the Bio International Conference taking place in June in the United States later this year. And that MOU will be about trading resources and international soft landing support for any companies seeking to grow in Montgomery County by marketing to entities in Taiwan and vice versa, companies in Taiwan looking to grow through U.S. market entry. So it was a it was a good trip and we have lots of homework and follow up to do. Thank you. So I'll just close up by saying you know, a couple of things. One is um, some of the, the federal entities in Montgomery County are really attractive to the bio industry, uh, particularly the presence of NIH uh, and the presence of the FDA, because I think everybody realizes that the way into approval for the U.S. drug market pretty much lies in Montgomery County. And for the cyber folks we talked to, um, a lot of them are very NIST aware. And so they know that NIST is headquartered in Montgomery County. And when they were talking about the standards that they met, uh, they often referenced NIST standards that they were required to meet. So they, they know who we are and they understand our strengths. And it's a, it's a real benefit to be able to talk about just not just the intellectual capital and the government presence in the county, but also um, get reassurances from people who've lived here about what they're likely to experience if they do come here, that it's a friendly place and the Asian community has always been welcome here. And it's, it's very diverse in the Asian community. Globally, it's very diverse. It really is reflected in the population of Montgomery County. So all those were really good things. I also spoke at the um, on the climate change, which is what I was invited to go do. And uh, one of the things that it was the same thing we saw last year is that all of us are dealing with the same stuff. You know, people are dealing with floods. They're dealing with, you know, how do they decarbonize as quickly as possible? Um, how do they move to, you know, use more of their waste resources rather than burning them or putting them in landfills? Uh, how do you how do you make a better use out of the resources that we have? And so it was good to hear other people tackling the same problems we're tackling, and it was good to be able to talk to them about their work they're doing. So uh, it was a really positive trip, and I'm, I'm really happy we were able to bring some people along with us. I'm glad that Judy and John found it useful. Uh, it was great last year and it's great again this year. So I'm going to turn on to, uh, I said we're going to turn to questions if anybody has any. Barry, is that your cue? Yep. So uh, if there are no questions on, on Taiwan, we also want to uh, have a quick conversation about Earth Month. Um, 
I already introduced Sarah and John, so I'm going to turn it over to them to talk about Earth Month and the work that will be happening around that in the county. Sarah? I believe John was going to speak first, but I'm, I'm happy to if prefer. Go ahead. Okay. <laughs> um, so, hi, I'm Sarah Kogel Smucker, Montgomery County's Climate Change Officer. I work in the County Executive's Office, leading the county's whole of government approach to combating climate change. Um, so, as the County Executive just highlighted, April is Earth Month. And since 1970, this month has focused on making healthier, more sustainable environment for generations to come. And now actions to combat climate change are an essential and tremendously urgent part of Earth Month. Um, scientists are issuing dire alarms on the urgency to act now on climate change by stopping emitting carbon pollution. Just last week, the UN Weather Agency issued a red alert on climate change, citing record smashing increases last year in land and water temperatures and melting of glaciers and sea ice. And so we are, as a county, adopting the theme of act now for um, the wide range of actions that we are taking and encouraging other folks around the county to take for Earth Month. month. Um, because here in Montgomery County, we can lead the way to stop emitting carbon pollution from our transportation, buildings, and energy systems as the county executive just referenced in the solutions that we're all implementing across the world. Um, and so we're working to expeditiously implement the county's 2021 climate action plan. Um, and I wanna highlight county resources for residents to take. There's individual simple actions that we can take in our day-to-day -day lives to address climate change like using less energy, riding the bus, and planting trees. Um, and we have county programs to support those actions. So to name a few, uh, Montgomery Energy Connection helps residents use less energy in their homes through simple actions like using more efficient light bulbs. The county's Ride On app helps you plan to use the bus to get around the county, reducing vehicle pollution. And some of those buses are already electric, and there's plans to make them all zero emission. Um, Alert Montgomery lets you know about dangerous weather conditions and other emergencies so that we stay safe from the extreme weather events that are all the more frequent and more extreme due to climate change. And Tree Montgomery provides free trees where qualified and offers great tree care resources. Um, and we need more trees because they're climate superheroes. They remove carbon pollution from the air and also provide shade for hotter summers. Uh, so this Earth Month to act now, information on these programs and more can be accessed through the county's climate portal. It's montgomerycountymd.gov backslash climate. And um, we urge residents to check it out and join the county to act now on Earth Month. Um, in a moment, Director Monger is going to speak to a lot of the awesome events that we also have planned, um, many of them highlighting climate action or supporting climate action. Uh, but before turning to that, um, as the climate change officer, I also wanted to um, highlight uh, from the uh, recommended county executives fiscal year 25 budget that was released the 365 million in investments to adopt climate solutions. Um, that's in the county executive's recommended fiscal year 25 operating budget. Um, and that includes 77.6 million towards new programs and investments like expanding solar, buying new clean electric buses, accelerating tree stump removal to allow new trees to be planted, and keeping county facilities running when the electric grid goes down by installing solar powered battery supported microgrids at key sites. Uh, so this act now theme, the individual actions, the county's actions, the proposed investments all come together to combat climate change. Um, and we look forward to an exciting Earth Month. Um, and I believe D Director Monger can speak more to um, some of the events coming up. Thanks so much. Uh, 
as the climate change officer was just saying, we are really, really, really urging uh, the theme of act now this Earth Month. So if you remember two things that I say today, number one is we are urging people to act now. And number two is that we really are looking to the media to help cover the many events we have going around the county this month because we need to get this important information out to the public as a as a as a key way of making sure we're continuing to educate people on the many ways as the climate change officer said that they can take action um, in in everyday lives um, as well as the importance of doing so so to give you a sense of some of the many, many activities we have going around the county, and it's more than 90 throughout the, the month across the county are, are happening, including community cleanups, composting workshops, our annual Green Fest event. Um, there's a lot, a lot of things happening, and we're really hoping that you all will, will help us spread the word about them. So to give you a, a very brief overview of what we have in the pipeline for the month, uh, the first week of the month we're going to be celebrating Food Waste Prevention Week with a media event at Mana Food Center in Gaithersburg on Tuesday, this coming Tuesday, April 2nd at 10 a.m. Um, Mana's a partner in developing programs to make sure consumable foods are reaching those in need and staying out of the waste stream. So it's a win for the environment and it's a way to really increase food security for an important population. We're also going to be highlighting our ongoing recycling successes. Uh, we're going to be having an event, an event highlighting paper processing at our recycling center. Uh, there's a lot of paper process every every day at our recycling center. We always, always want to make sure we're educating the public on the many services available to them um, at our recycling center in the county. Again, to act now to keep things out of the waste stream. Um, in terms of energy efficiency, we're also going to be having our annual energy summit. This year's is April 15th and 16th. Uh, at the Civic Center in Silver Spring. Um, this is a chance for energy professionals and, and others in the building sector to, to talk about all the really important and fast paced developments in the building sector. As the climate change officer mentioned, this is a key way of making sure we're driving down our emissions in our built environment, which is a core part of our climate plan. And we're ending with a bang uh, with more trees, um, celebrating Arbor Day and the recent 800,000 plus grant that the county received to plant 1,400 trees in equity areas, schools around the county. That's Friday, April 26th. And I mentioned our Green Fest event is gonna be uh, Saturday, April 27th at the Black Rock Arts Center in Gaithersburg, a large public event that's focused on, again, celebrating, educating, and acting now. Um, so we hope to see you at those events and we hope you will spread the word about those events and look for press releases uh, from the department on each of those for more information. Thanks so much. Thank you both. Um, I'll talk a little bit more about climate change. I was, you know, I've been just looking to refresh my memory about when things happened. And I was thinking, I was at that the first um, Earth Day in 1970, and that's how far back uh, the real movement begins. And Gaylord Nelson, who was a senator. Um, came up with this, I would say would be the congressional leader who created Earth Day, and it was just really, really important. And some commentators said that about 20 million Americans actually took place in the Earth Day demonstrations, and that was about 10% of the U.S. population, which is no small number of people. Another interesting factoid I found was that in 1958, there was a TV program that was put on by Bell Laboratories. It was the science series, and it was a primetime television uh, show, and they warned in 1958, six CO2 emissions from fossil fuel use could warm the earth to, agree, to a degree that melts the polar ice caps and creates a catastrophic rise in sea levels. That's 1958. So it's been a long time that we've, that we've been busily ignoring of what's going on around us. And it's, uh, I mean, it's really, frankly, disturbing. It's, it's truly reaching emergency proportions, and yet very few places act like it's an emergency. Um, we intend to act now, and we intend to be sure that we're taking action and we're paying attention to, to the most critical things that we're able to affect immediately. Uh, it's, 
it's been a long time, like I said. Local governments are on the front lines of defense against the impacts of climate change. There's no massive federal money helping us deal with uh, stormwater problems, for example, that we're facing now. We're doing all this through investments, through policies, and most importantly, through our willingness to turn policies into actions. The county continues to expand its waste reduction and recycling programs, modernize our recycling facility at Shady Grove, and our goal is to monetize our waste stream. When I say monetize, there's a lot of value in things that we either incinerate or that we put in the dump. And other jurisdictions have gotten way ahead of this on this and are extracting more and more materials and actually selling them and they have value. And that reduces the cost of the programs that we run. And our goal is to monetize our waste stream by finding and recovering as much of the waste stream as possible and finding uses for these materials. Um, our efforts to make our buildings and transportation less of a burden on the environment are paying off. Uh, and our Department of Environmental Protection has been gearing up for tracking energy use and planning for energy improvements that will take place in over 1900 buildings countywide. We're also transitioning our bus fleet from fossil fuel based to solar powered electric and green hydrogen. We highlighted in our recent FY25 recommendations that we're going to be spending uh, between our capital and operating budget among various departments approximately $365 million that will have impacts on how climate change is affecting us. The progress is encouraging, but does not make up for the fact that climate change is real human made and, and a significant threat to the survival of our species and our way of life. And we remain in the climate crisis and frankly conditions continue far worse, uh, to be far worse than early projections of what might happen. I remember when people talked about how many inches sea levels might rise by 2050, 2080, and now you're talking about how many feet sea levels are gonna rise and how many places are gonna be on the water and this is truly uh, a coming threat. The Arctic ice shelf um, ice forms are collapsing. The uh, Antarctic uh, ice shelves are collapsing. And probably the scariest thing is the presence of cooler water is slowing down what they call the convector that goes from the you know, southern Atlantic up along the east coast of the United States and then goes across to Europe. And when it goes across to Europe, it brings warm air over there. That's part of the water being brought up for the tropics. The uh, convector, they now say, has reached the point that it's very likely that it's gonna turn off. Turn off means instead of going that far north and going over to the coast of Europe, it's actually gonna turn back and go south again before it ever gets to Europe. And when that happens, Last time it happened, Europe experienced the mini ice age. It will be cold and it's not going to be anything like any of us have any living memory of. It's not going to be like a week of cold weather. It's going to be a prolonged period of cold weather because you're not going to be getting the warm air. So these are the kind of things that are actually happening in real time. Uh, we keep urging people to take this seriously. And, and I remind you, we'll talk, continue to talk about the things the county is doing. Um, but we need people um, in the community to do the part they need to do, whether it's electrifying your vehicles or replacing your natural gas furnace with um, electric heat pumps. Uh, we need people to do these things because government alone is not going to be able to turn this back. Uh, I'm encouraged in the car industry that the prices are beginning to come down and both as a result of competition, but also just because of more efficiency and better batteries. And that's critical because getting cars to be clean would result in a major reduction of emissions in Montgomery County. And if we could do that and heat pumps on our houses, we'd make significant progress. I won't get all the way there, but those are two relatively simple things to do that could be really consequential. But now we're forced to spend hundreds of millions of dollars yearly in response to the damage done by major fossil fuel companies and centuries of unsustainable behavior. Uh, this is, I think it's really sad to be blunt. In our country and across the world, the fossil fuel industry lied, and that's the only word you can use, about what they knew about climate change going back over 40 years. Their scientists told them 
exactly what would happen, much as that Bell Science story in 1958 projected what would happen. And instead of telling people that we need to change, that we're going to change our industry, that we're going to be on the take our profits and be on the forefront of creating a manageable um, power structure. They continued to tell people that this was a lie. They spent hundreds of millions of dollars convincing people that there was nothing to worry about and attacking and discrediting scientists who were discovering exactly what Exxon had been told by their very own scientists. So instead of acting responsibly, they insisted that consumers could go on as before, even though their own studies showed that there was a lot to be worried about. Now they take no responsibility for the disaster they created, and they expect our residents to pick up the tab. And unless and until there's the political will to require that these companies bear the cost of our mitigation efforts, residents here and throughout the country are stuck with the growing costs of fixing things. We don't have the option of letting our streets flood. That's, that's not tenable. So these are things we're going to have to deal with. And I just, you know, it would be nice if there was the will to force these companies to pay for the damage that they've done and it's going to wind up on our backs. It's not fair, but we really don't have a choice. So we'll do what we can to address these issues. Uh, last year, the Science Journal published research from Exxon's own scientists and, and what has actually occurred over time. And this analysis demonstrated that back as far as 1977, Exxon knew the long-term impacts on climate change, but continued to cast doubt that this was a real thing. So you can see this chart. Um, you ought to be disturbed by it, um, and readers ought to be disturbed by it, because what it tells you is that all the stuff that we're experiencing, it was known that this was going to happen. And they basically, as long as they could make money, that was the most important thing to them, not the health and well-being of any of us. Um, no matter how many times I see these numbers, they still astound me. I can't believe our planet has reached a degree and a half Fahrenheit warmer just in my lifetime so far. Um, had this country and other nations responded a decade or more ago this, that to what they were told was going to happen, we might have avoided the need for as much mitigation that we have to do at this point and that averted some of the really bad future outcomes. There was a possibility of preventing this from running away. There is very little possibility now of preventing climate change from running away. And what we do now is really going to focus on trying to mitigate the effects. And hopefully in the long term, when enough people adopt these things that we have to do, we actually will see real change. But what this all depends on is our willingness as a community to work together to fight on the climate change. And it's imperative that we do this together. All of you have seen the increased flooding here in the county are experiencing the consequences firsthand, and our large investments in stormwater, for example, are going to continue to grow. In short, we have to deal with climate change on two fronts. We have to reduce our carbon pollution to lessen the future impacts, and we have to invest in mitigating the impacts that we're already experiencing. In many respects, we have taken the lead in this county in combating climate change. Hopefully, we're an example for other counties to look at and say it can be done. And we've made some pretty monumental steps forward, but there's still a long way to go to reduce emissions by 80% by 2027 and 100% by 2035. When we um, started on this journey, there, were, there was a lot less certainty about what can be done. I think maybe the most encouraging thing over the last five or six years has been emerging technologies that indicate that many of the things we didn't know were possible when we passed our climate change a legislation initially, uh, that there are actually solutions that had not appeared on the horizon when that bill was first passed. So at least we're in a better place, and I think there are greater possibilities for dealing with it. But if we all don't do this together, it's going to be really challenging. Um, Finally, um, Earth Day begins on, uh, Earth Month begins on Monday, and I encourage everyone to get involved and discover what we can do to be carbon neutral at home. Uh, we're going to take your questions first, um, but first I want to stop uh, for health dates from our health team, then we'll go back to the media. 
Thank you, Mr. County Executive. Uh, a very short health update this week. We are, in addition to seeing declining rates of COVID, we're seeing declining hospitalizations due to influenza. And so it looks like we may be coming out of, of that, uh, the seasonal uh, flu respiratory disease. Uh, still urging caution, uh, again, for our higher risk populations. Uh, we also wanted to mention that uh, the that recently there was a report released from the University of Wisconsin Population Health Institute and the Robert Wood Johnson Foundation. They released their annual county health uh, rankings, and we were pleased to see that Montgomery County was again uh, listed as one of the healthiest counties in America. Uh, this is primarily looking at health outcomes such as uh, the loss of life under the age of 75, um, and Montgomery County has uh, better longevity uh, numbers than most of our jurisdictions in Maryland and in the United States. But importantly, it also looks at a lot of the factors that lead to uh, those healthy outcomes. It, and it, we, we are seeing lower rates of obesity and uh, lower rates of smoking in our county. Um, we're also seeing uh, better physical activity, um, and some of these are, are, are related to the, the policies and the partnerships across county government, uh, things that uh, DEP, DEP mentioned earlier uh, during this briefing. Um, you know, better air, there's better air quality in Montgomery County than most jurisdictions, uh, and these are, this is data from before um, the county switched to elect, electrical buses. So we, we hope to see that those, those data become uh, better in future years as well. Um, better access to, edu um, to exercise opportunities uh, and county policies that make uh, gym memberships at our rec centers uh, free can contribute to that as well. Um, and we are seeing lower um, uh, teen pregnancies and lower rates of low birth weight babies in our county. And um, again, there's lots of efforts by our colleagues at Health and Human Services uh, to work with populations that could be at risk for, um, for uh, these outcomes and try to improve on them. So uh, we're, we're happy to see where these rankings are. Uh, the rankings do highlight there continue to be disparities uh, within our populations within the county. And that, again, is work that we continue need to need to address so that everyone in the county uh, can have the same types of outcomes. Uh, with that, I'd like to turn it over to Dr. Bridgers to, for any additional comments. Uh, no additional comments this afternoon. Thank you, Mr. O'Donnell. Okay, that, that said, uh, we will now open the floor up to media with any questions about uh, climate change, Taiwan, the health uh, report, any of those topics or anything else you have on your plate that you'd like to ask. Floor is open. Go ahead, Miriam. Thank you. Uh, just uh, quickly on the Taiwan trip, can you just give an overview of what other leaders or officials uh, joined you? Well, it was uh, Kate Stewart went with us and she was the from you know vice president of the county council. And then it was Judy Costello and John Mogger. So it was four of us this time. Thank you. Any other questions? Tommy? Hi, um, the fully electrified buses plan was mentioned a few times. Do you know the time frame for where um, the county could fully electrify the bus buses in the county? Um, I know the, the goal was to get it all done by, John, do you remember what year we had targeted or Sarah? I believe it's zero emission, um, first of all. So a lot of those will be electric. Some might be green hydrogen. Um, and it's, uh, I believe it's on track for the 2035 goal right. where the entire county fleet would be zero emission by 2035, but I can double check that and get back to you. And frankly, my hope is should financial conditions improve that we can actually accelerate that. I actually would take one of two things. Economic conditions improve or the price of batteries or hydrogen comes down enough that you can buy more buses for the same amount of money. 
I think one or both of those is likely to happen. The only question is how much does it come down? Thank you, Tommy. Any additional questions from the media? Any additional questions? Going once, going twice, three times. Okay, thank you. Mr. County Executive, any closing remarks? No, have a good rest of the week and uh, see you, I guess, again in Earth Month. Thank you everybody for joining us today. We'll see you uh, again in our next outing. Just a couple things to remember, you heard act now several times. So um, we need you to act now and, and take a step towards uh, climate change, uh, not just next month, but continuing beyond that. The other thing is, is that uh, we're at the very end of Women's History Month. Uh, so make sure that you acknowledge those uh, sheroes in your neighborhood and life. Uh, the county executive actually will be going out uh, tomorrow to visit some uh, women-owned businesses in the county uh, in honor of Women's History Month. So thank you very much for joining us, and we will see you very soon. Thank you. Bye. But it makes you think about things that maybe you hadn't thought about before, about including them. In, in your record keeping. And there are things that, you know, that come up in your life that are, that we haven't addressed. And so there's a good place to put it there too. Well, let's dive a little bit deeper into the toolkit. It's a broad checklist of information. Um, can you tell us some of the specific